OK, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to a brown bag on discussion on the Center of Studying Slavery in Charleston, also known as the CSSC. My name is Aisha Heichel. I will be your moderator today. I work as the manager of archival services at the College of Charleston's Avery Research Center of African History and Culture, but I also serve as the chair of the CSC, sorry, CSSC Public History Working Group. Next slide. So today's discussion will have um, five presenters. <laughs> I will be giving an introduction to the Center of Studying and Slavery. Um, Ms. Mary Jo Fairchild will talk about archival research and academic uh, working group. Then we have a discussion by Trent Humphreys and Keisha Pride on the hidden hands that built these walls. And then we'll have a discussion by Dr. Annette Wilson sorry dr watson i'm so sorry um on the hidden hands in the garden project um and then we will have a discussion with dr Kristen owens on if these walls could talk um, center of studying slavery in charleston established in 2018 as a part of the universities and studying slavery project they it's a consortia of about 61 universities that are national and international that um, are committed to understanding their institutions uh, involvement um, in slavery and here at the college we are consisting of stakeholders and faculty and staff that have been a part of this movement um, and this is the link to the website. Next slide. Um, there are other universities in the state of South Carolina, including USC, Furman, Clemson, and the Soledo. Um, they all organize differently. Um, here at the college, we have working groups. Um, we have academic research group that are committed to understanding and doing the research to understand the documents that prove uh, enslavement um, contributions um, to the college and to the city. And then we have the public history and just does public programming and outreach. And then we have a social justice group that is trying to readdress the atrocities and try to make reparations a legacy of slavery. And then we have the education component. We want to um, really, so public history in both ed the education K through 12 would kind of uh, challenge the norms of how people understand Charleston and understand slavery. And so the K through 12 is really working with the school system to uh, improve and um, help these students have a broader understanding of their place um, in the world. And I'll turn it over to Ms. Mary Jo Fairchild. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aisha. Um, am, I, am I on the audio? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so thanks, thanks so much for um, in, inviting me to participate in this um, conversation. Um, I'm going to, um, as Aisha um, described, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Academic Research Working Group, um, particularly focusing on um, some of the findings that we found preliminarily um, over the past year or so um, and, and um, how this informs the work of the, the Center for the Study of Slavery. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, you know, briefly touching on the mission and goals of the group, um, but then again, the, the research outcomes are gonna um, be the, um, you know, the bulk of, of my remarks, um, but, you know, we always wanna um, think about the future as well. So I'll, I'll wrap up there. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, the the mission and goals of the the working group um, the mission is to you know support the academic research and teaching that examines the the role of slavery in the history of the college of charleston um, and also in the region um, in order to foster a deeper public understanding of slavery and its complex leg legacies um, and so to this end the committee's um, got many irons in the fire um, First of all, you know, our, our you know, efforts to conduct uh, the preliminary research um, 
and also develop tools for storage and access to the, the data and the research um, findings that, that we're able to compile. Um, we also are committed to working with the public history, social justice, and K through 12 um, working groups um, that Aisha just um, articulated um, to, to make this material available to scholars, students, community members, and, and the general public. Uh, another aspect of the, the work is um, facilitating an annual lecture series or a, a series of lectures each year um, in which we um, can um, take the opportunity to host scholars with expertise on the intersections of the institution of slavery, academic institutions, and more. Um, so the, the scope of the lectures um, we hope will be to um, address strategies and, and approaches to the study of slavery at the university level. And, and we did um, have uh, plans to bring Dr. Marissa Fuentes to join us on campus for um, you know, a good 48 hours of, of discussion, conversation, uh, uh, lectures, presenting, and interaction. Um, but unfortunately, um, that was to take place on March 30th. And um, so hopefully we'll be able to, to uh, work with Dr. Fuentes uh, in the fall or in the spring and she can come and, um, and join us. Um, uh, the other sort of more long-term um, goals of, of this committee in particular um, have to do with proposing undergraduate coursework that interrogates ties to the system of slavery, the institutional and regional levels, and then also to create a research fellowship that um, provides compensation to students and scholars who are working um, uh, to research and um, amplify the endeavors of the, the center. Um, so in particular, the, um, you know, talking just explicitly about the research goal um, of, of, of our work as a committee, um, our, our directions are informed by several principles. First of all, we want to interrogate the historical evidence and the sources using a lens that centers the experiences of enslaved persons as, as fully as possible. Um, and the discoveries and the conclusions that we make in this process of research will be leveraged to support restorative justice dialogue and efforts to reconcile with the persistent legacies of slavery in Charleston. Also, we all recognize that it is essential to uh, make visible the contributions of thousands of people whose labor, forced and, and then stolen, constructed and shaped this institution. And finally, um, you know, we're, we're really committed to working together um, with uh, colleagues and in the community to expand the dialogue and the narratives around the past through critically evaluating the archival evidence um, that we have. Um, reading between the lines, recognizing and giving voice to the silences in the archival record, um, and, and really sort of to, to quote unquote trouble, trouble the archive um, so that we might be able to inform substantive changes in st structural power dynamics um, rooted in, in white supremacy um, here in, in, um, in Charleston. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, we decided to, um, you know, approach the research from a number of levels. And I should say members of the working group um, uh, represent multiple um, areas of the college and, um, you know, folks have multiple interests. Um, for example, um, Dr. Sam Flores in the classics department um, is very interested in, in looking at the, you know, what students were reading, the curriculum, and how that ties into, um, you know, the uh, institutional legacies of, um, of slavery. Um, Dr. Mary Trent is really interested in material, cultural, and intellectual history. Um, Dr. Adam Dombey's um, looking at the, the college prior to the secession, um, in, in during the secession crisis in, in South Carolina. Um, and, and Dr. Shannon Eves, our um, liaison with the executive committee of the Center for the Study of Slavery, um, is, is really interested in, in understanding how we can um, build all these tools into something that can, can um, be publicly accessible um, as, as well. Um, so with that being said, we needed to start from the very beginning um, to nail down 
um, some of the um, details that have been omitted from the, the dominant narratives um, that we so often um, hear uh, and, and read uh, about the, the history of the College of, of Charleston here. Um, and so we started um, with endowment, which was really established even before the College of Charleston was formally chartered in 1785. Um, you know, briefly, I'll I'm going to leave out a lot of explanatory um, commas in this presentation in the interest of time, but um, you know, always hoping that we can continue the conversation in the future. But briefly, um, you know, the the endowment. Um, there were six individuals who bequeathed money um, to to what would become the College of Charleston um, in the decade um, between 1770 and 1780, and um, so we decided to start with these these six folks, and um, so we we went down, drilled down, and looked at um, wills, estate inventories, probate records, um, in order to um, investigate um, each of these six individuals' ties um, to to slavery. And and lo and behold, every single one of them um, owned um, enslaved people. Um, and for example, um, you know, the first person to bequeath monies uh, to to what would become the College of Charleston was a, a man named Benjamin Smith. And um, I think, you know, Smith is, um, you know, a good example that he's out from the endowment because there's um, such a uh, disparate um, understanding of, of, of um, him and he, he represents many of the early leaders of the college. So um, if we look at, you know, the traditional um, literature and scholarly sources on um, Benjamin Smith, um, for example, in um, the institutional history by James Easterby called um, the College of Charleston a, a history, and it was published in 1930. Easterby um, says this of Benjamin Smith. He was a former speaker of the House of Commons and vice president of the Library Society, full stop. Um, if we look a little bit closer to a more recently um, written, um, you know, sort of biographical note, if you will, um, we, in, in, in this case, Wikipedia, um, Benjamin Smith was a slave trader. This is um, a direct quote from the article. Benjamin Smith was a slave trader, plantation owner, ship owner, merchant, banker, and politician in Charlestown, South Carolina. He served as Speaker of the Royal Assembly from 1755 to 1763. So um, there's a lot of um, biographical information that um, uh, you know, comes before the fact that um, you know, his public service career that is sort of centered in Easterby's definition. And you know, my point here is that this, is, this represents um, you know, a, a, the 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 work that we're doing here is to to build and complement and and really flesh out um, the more commonly accepted narratives and understandings of of the past here in in Charleston um, in order to um, create better understanding um, and so so Smith in his will bequeaths five hundred pounds sterling to the College of Charleston um, and if you look further in his will which um, I've put a couple of screenshots on this slide here and underlined um, a couple of passages, um, but he he names 10 enslaved people as bequests to his children and, and his wife, um, but he also um, owned uh, plantations or slave labor camps at Dachon and Acabee, and um, in his will, um, the unnamed people enslaved at these locations were, quote, to be sold and disposed of, the profits of which would go towards the estate and then be divided amongst his heirs. Um, so he was wealthy because um, of all the free labor he was um, benefiting from as a result of being um, a, an enslaver. Next slide, please. Um, and if we, I, I sort of talked about this already, um, if we can go to the next slide also, thanks. Um, so after the endowment, we um, began investigating um, the ties of um, the first, 
presidents and um, first trustees um, of the college because um, you know following following um, these trails we can begin to again tease out some of the silences in the archival record um, and this screenshot of this spreadsheet um, is is really to, to show you know what what the committee is doing in order to um, be able to state with unequivocally that seven of the nine first presidents and 19 of the 23 trustees outlined in the 1785 charter owned enslaved people. In order to um, substantiate that, those numbers and those facts, we did a lot of research and we're storing all of our research data in a spreadsheet that looks like this. <laughs> um, so it's just sort of um, behind the scenes, if you will. Next slide, please. And so um, my example here um, with with this phase of the preliminary research that we've done and and here I, I would really like to um, say that um, Dr. Shannon Eaves and one of her students um, in the master's program of, um, history, the College of Charleston named Patrick Sheridan have been um, tremendously um, have, have, have worked tremendously hard to um, to to build out a lot of this um, information and data. Um, and so, you know, Robert Smith was the first president of the, the College of Charleston, um, and he largely supported all of the operations not covered by tuition um, from students with his own money. Um, he also, you know, he collected a salary because he was um, a member of the clergy, was bishop of the Episcopal Church in South Carolina. Um, but the vast majority of his wealth came from rice cultivated um, on, on, on plantations that he owned and operated in the region. Um, and these included Brabant and um, Point of Pope. So um, yeah, I'll show a little bit more evidence, but you know, we, we use this evidence that we're building to, to unequivocally demonstrate again that um, the money that Smith owned um, to support the college operations in those early years was wealth generated primarily from the labors of people he enslaved. Um, and in the archives and special collections, we actually have Smith's business ledger. Um, and um, I have a couple of slides that um, sort of demonstrate how valuable this ledger is for our understanding, um, you know, Smith and um, the role of enslaved people during his tenure. Next slide, please. So here um, is, is again this uh, page from um, Smith's ledger um, that is, he, he was very detailed in, in keeping um, records. Um, but this is this is during the period in which um, the some some uh, classrooms were, were being built. Um, actually, the old um, barracks were being restored um, for classrooms. And um, you can see here uh, that the quote unquote Negro brick layer, layer, layers and laborers um, appear frequently in these records um, and um, the arrow is is uh, just above the arrow you can see um, that uh, he loaned the trustees of the College of Charleston um, cash um, and also um, money to compensate most likely the owners of uh, enslaved bricklayers for 26 days of work um, and um, that's you know, repeated throughout the ledger. So you you see again, you don't look have to look too closely to to begin seeing the contributions of um, enslaved people to the built environment on campus. Next slide, please. Um, and here's an, just one more example um, from Smith's uh, ledger uh, in 1791. Um, if you can see, I don't know if I have an arrow here, but John Callahan was. Um, a, an alum of the college, and then he also um, taught briefly um, at the college. And here, um, Smith is actually documenting um, his uh, loan of enslaved people to John Callahan and Nancy and her two children, Charmont and Chloe. Um, and this is, you know, this, I don't, I have not seen um, you know, John Callahan and, and Smith's, um, I have not seen this teased out in any sort of published scholarship or um, anything before. So, you know, again, this is the goal of, of, 
of our of our working group here is to um, identify um, omissions in 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 our um, understanding of the past and um, and use them to hold ourselves accountable um, and and um, for repairs and reconciliation at present. Um, okay, next slide. And again, we just we we used a, a lot of wills, a lot of estate um, inventories and probate records to um, to to make these connections. And this is a screenshot of Smith's will, um, and it's it's a small portion of it, but you can see um, that. Um, he in in the estate inventory that we have on record um he lists enslaved people by name um and also for most of them a value is attached to uh, their bodies in 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 this inventory um and uh, so you know here we see actually you know the names of individuals um that is also, I, I think, something that can be very powerful when we're trying to, um, you know, understand um, and and more fully represent identities um, and that have contributed to <laughs> institutional histories. Um, and I think next slide. Um, that's just a really quick um, overview, really the tip of the iceberg of um, you know the research that we've done so far, um, and 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 our our hope for the future um, as we continue to collaborate with the center um, and and other um, entities on campus and in the community. Um, <clears throat> briefly, I'll just say that we do hope um, that that some of the research here is. Um, you know, we, we can publish and disseminate this um, via a blog or social media, uh, published essays. Um, that's sort of our next step. Um, and then, you know, again, to continue collaborating with colleagues um, and, and, and really um, work hard to host and promote uh, public lectures and opportunities for students, faculty and community members to engage with scholars, um, you know, interrogating um, the, the intersection of uh, institutions and universities um, with um, the history of, of slavery in, in North America. Um, so my contact information is, is there just below, but um, I really look forward to um, continuing the dialogue and, and hearing from everyone else who um, is on this panel. Okay, I'm going to talk about the project uh, that I am a part of, which is the Hidden Hands That Built These Walls. And this is just going to be very brief on an update on where this project is. Uh, slide, please. So the Hidden Hands That Built These Walls, the, the goal of the project is to make a physical marking of the campus as a place where enslavement happened and where the buildings were built by enslaved labor. So the way that we are going to do this is to create a sculptural bottle tree uh, being a West African art form. And that location where it is right there, that's the Women and Gender Studies building. And then Rita is in the back. So it's it's a courtyard and this this area is meant to be a place of reflection as well as a place of discovery where if you walk through, you can read on the plaque, uh, most likely the research that Mary Jo Fairchild and her team, the, the rest of the, the team has done and just learn more about it, have, have a physical object of remembrance that can be seen by everyone. So it's it's really this is a project of visibility and we uh, really want to make it very beautiful. So that's where we're at with this project and uh, Kiesia Pride next will talk a little bit about what she's doing with the project. OK, so um, I was brought into this project to just do more research. And so th the goal behind the research um, for the project was to establish a narrative of 
um, the lives of these enslaved workers and um, of the work that they they did on the campus. So um, starting that, I kind of went through the board meeting minutes um, when the of when the college was first being established, um, and just kind of looking through for indications of um, usage of enslaved labor, um, considering the verbiage and, of course, the fact that a lot of times these um, enslaved laborers were omitted from the conversation. And so um, some things that I found that I've um, been looking into is um, in 1824, there was a, a teacher at the school, a professor at the college that um, was allowed $50 for um, what the meeting says, uh, compensation of a servant. And then later in these meeting minutes, there's a hundred dollar expense um, listed for um, expenses of a servant. And so being as though it doesn't say like the, a name of the servant or any type of indication of who this servant or servants may be. Um, that was something that that I thought was um, interesting to look into. Unfortunately, I wasn't really able to to come across anything more about um, this particular servant um, in terms of this professor uh, looking into his life. I think he he passed not soon after um, or not soon later when this was recorded, so there wasn't much. Um, next, we kind of looked at Randolph Hall, which is um, the first building built for the college, and then looking at that. Um, we we looked at the contract of William Bell because in the meeting minutes, um, there's a transaction that states um, that they're using four hands, and so um, this this verbiage made us think, okay, four hands that must be enslaved labor. So um, looking into William Bell, what we were able to find was that. He did have um, two plantations in Goose Creek, Spring Grove and Pine Grove. Um, I found records that state that these plantations were on um, Back River in Goose Creek. And so what we believe is that, well, he also owned two, two homes in downtown Charleston on Society Street. So what we believe is that he would um, transport these enslaved laborers um, from the Back River to Cooper River in downtown to uh, work on the building uh, with him. And so um, we also found um, an appraisal of his, his property um, in 1853 when he passed. And so in this appraisal, there's a list of the enslaved workers that were um, still on those two plantations when he passed. There are two enslaved workers um, who are listed as a carpenter and bricklayer um, that we think possibly could have worked um, on the building, but unfortunately, because of the the time frame, there's really no way to um, verify. Another way that we've tried is just looking at um, transactions of um, enslaved workers. So looking at bill of sales, possible um, purchases of enslaved um, workers during the time period that the, the building was built. Um, we, we did find um, in 1825, there was a bill of sale for an enslaved worker that um, William Bell brought named Janet. But again, it doesn't, it doesn't tell um, her, her um, what she did. So, these are kind of just some of this, the setbacks with the research is really um, establishing names and really trying to create this narrative. Um, another struggle with this research is that um, there, are, there were multiple William, William Bells, both in the lineage of um, the William Bell that we're looking into and also in Charleston. So um, some of the records is kind of hard to tell which William Bell they're, they're speaking of. So, for example, there's mentioning of a William Bell on um, Charleston City Council, but again, it's it's just kind of hard to verify if it's the same William Bell um, that I've been looking into. Another um, big thing is really the location 
the exact location of um, these plantations. There have been some records that indicate that maybe these plantations were um, either connected to uh, Medway Plantation, which also made bricks, or um, yeah, they, they produced bricks, or either um, was Medway before it became Medway. But again, the, the records are kind of like, it's really hard to distinguish. So going forward in this research, there's, there's so much more that can be done, not just looking at William Bell and Randolph Hall, but also um, later contractors, um, possible presidents, and the ways in which their enslaved workers were probably involved on campus. And of course, there are multiple other buildings that were built by enslaved laborers that we can look into. Thank you. Hey y'all, um, Annette Watson here. Um, uh, again, it, it's such a pleasure to be in this panel and talking about uh, our related projects uh, on campus. And so I'm going to talk about uh, a project that I'm involved in and you can uh, forward to the next slide. Um, called the hidden hands that built this soil playing off of uh, the the hidden hands uh, that built these walls projects that have been going on and our project uh, and I run the master of environmental and sustainability studies program here um, our project is located at the stono preserve and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that location in a moment. Uh, this is and, and I wanted there's a lot of uh, slides in this because I wanted to help you visualize the, the site and this is a uh, uh, the site of course it was formerly known as Dixie Plantation uh, and was bequeathed to the College of Charleston Foundation in 1995 I believe. Uh, and most recently, the college has uh, changed the name of the site to the Stono Preserve uh, for the purpose of College of Charleston teaching and learning activities, as well as maintaining it as a, a, a conservation easement site. And uh, this particular image is is the image uh, of, of one of one side of the of the row of live oaks that used to uh, lead up to uh, a former uh, plantation uh, building on the site. Uh, next slide. Um, and so the purpose of our project and and uh, I don't know if uh, our program coordinator Lucy Davis managed to, to get in on this uh, on uh, uh, viewing uh, the presentation, but she manages all of our on the ground uh, daily activities as at what we call the student garden. And since 2016, we've been operating this student garden at the site um, producing food uh, for both the internal College of Charleston community uh, as, a, as a local food bank, so like the Cougar Food Pantry, as well as other community uh, food bank sites. And even through this pandemic, we've been uh, producing uh, food for those kinds of organizations. And so our, you know, I came in as director in 2016 and and saw that there was an opportunity to expand the mission of our garden site to include more themes of social justice, especially given where our garden site uh, is located out uh, at the Stono Preserve. And the purpose of our project is to highlight the intellectual and physical labors that enslaved peoples and their descendants uh, contributed to low country agriculture and the modern cultures of food uh, in the southeast. Next slide. Um, and so this is a, an image from some of the work done uh, by Dr. Maureen Hayes in documenting the early antebellum uh, inhabitants of this place that was once called Dixie Plantation. And this is a literal map of the site. Uh, and and uh, this is a site located in Hollywood, South Carolina. Um, right now, the college is protecting over 800 acres at this site total. 
Um, but it, it's a place obviously that has a lot of troubled history. Uh, it, it was the location uh, of at first the Yamasee War of 1715 to 1717. Uh, the Yamasee uh, is one of many Native American groups that had lived in the area and, and that planters had uh, enslaved at first. Uh, that some of Maureen Hayes's research had uncovered that the earliest enslaved inhabitants uh, were Native Americans uh, and, and then Africans had become imported and uh, enslaved on this site. Um, but the site is also located near the, the, the Stono Rebellion of 1739. Uh, and so again, a, a lot of uh, history uh, at this particular site. Next slide. But what we wanted to do is present uh, a blank slate for co-producing a living curriculum about this history uh, with multiple communities, uh, educators, the local Hollywood community, many of, of whom are likely the descendants of, uh, of, the, uh, of the people that had worked on that site, uh, Gullah Geechee communities and other indigenous peoples of the of the southeast. And this is a, a literal picture of of the site. And, and what you see here is uh, a section of the garden that we're dedicating for this site uh, and a deer fence. That's what you see in the in the background is a deer fence that that separates uh, those creatures in the forest from our gardens. Next slide. And this is an overhead view uh, of our gardens and, and the garden site. Uh, you see, uh, you actually enter it uh, from the bottom right hand corner is where you would normally enter our garden site. And our, uh, our site is about three, three, to four, three to five acres is what is represented here that's cleared within, within the Stono Preserve. And the red area indicates again that expansion area uh, where we would like to situate this teaching demonstration garden. Uh, we have been growing some things out there uh, like the gourds you saw in the in the prior photo uh, as well as watermelons and and other kinds of row crops but um, what we're trying to do here is again develop more of a, a teaching garden similar to what we're already doing we we engage with uh, a lot of different local area schools uh, and Guadmala Island is is nearby as well and we engage with a number number of those K through 12 uh, classes to come out and and learn about things like composting and nu nutrient cycling and and again some of the more n natural and ecosystem oriented knowledges uh, but again, what uh, what both our students and myself uh, are focusing in on with this expansion is also learning about uh, the social justice element and 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 learning about some of these histories of of land management in the area. Next slide. Um, what you see in the picture on the right hand or on the left hand side is is some of our existing plots. The, the ones in the foreground are with our partnership for the aquarium where we grow lettuce for um, for the turtle restoration program there, as well as some of our raised beds for uh, food pantry production. Um, and, and really, if you were to look out uh, to the back and to the right hand side of that photo, uh, that's where our uh, new demonstration garden is going to go. And so what we've been doing over the last, you know, I would say two years is trying to have conversations, engage more partners that are going to be involved in this program. And, and again, that's one of my, uh, certainly one of my hopes uh, for sitting in on this panel is getting more people uh, involved with this effort and, and planning this space. And so certainly um, our early discussions were with Bernard Powers, who advised us uh, very clearly to, to emphasize the, the positivity uh, as far as um, what we can learn about agriculture and sustainable agriculture from these early agriculturalists in the area. Uh, we've also engaged with um, uh, the Ojibwe run Steamworks Farm uh, that gave us a number of ideas of types uh, of things that we can demonstrate in the garden. Uh, one, uh, one of our collaborators that I'd like to highlight in this short talk is uh, our work with Queen Quet. Um, 
who runs both the Gullah Geechee Sea Island Coalition as well as an organization called the Gullah Geechee Sustainability Think Tank. And, and that think tank is um, a collective of, uh, of community members and academics to, to help guide and shape uh, research uh, in the region. And I've, I've actually been a part of that group for the last six years and, and so vetted this idea of a project initially also uh, with that group. Uh, next slide. And so, uh, yeah, as I say, I want to highlight a few of the things that we've learned very recently with our collaborations with Queen Quet. Um, she came out to the garden space in the fall and made a number of key recommendations uh, that I'll, I'll be going over. And, and in particular, she also reviewed our list of plants. Um, that uh, I worked with an undergraduate bachelor essay student that collated a list of plants uh, that were uh, either brought from Africa uh, to North America through the through the through the Middle Passage, um, or uh, or uh, what plants uh, the new inhabitants would be uh, adapting to for low, low country cuisine. And you can go to the next slide. And so this is a, a partial list and I'm going to just show you, just flash you a couple partial lists and uh, I'd be more than happy um, to share our existing full lists as well as share this actual presentation with anyone. And so this is a partial list of some uh, of those uh, plants that originate in Africa that were literally uh, seeds sown in the hems uh, of dresses uh, of uh, West Africans that were coming over, forced to, to come over and start life here. Um, and so we would envision that some of these beds would be divided into particular themes, uh, cash crop and the, and the contribution of enslaved labor to cash crop production, of course, but also a number of these species uh, are very specific to subsistence and household use by the early inhabitants. Um, we see a picture here of when we, we grew okra last year on the, on the site and collected okra. Next slide. Uh, and uh, again, this is also um, a list of plants that initially come from the Americas or Europe, but were adapted for uh, Gullah Geechee cuisine or medicinal use. Uh, these are photos of uh, when we had a harvest uh, last year of uh, red beans. Uh, and so you see both in, in the bin some red beans as well as the okra and, and some other products that we were uh, donating to a food bank. Uh, but a number of these other um, grow products could certainly, um, again, demonstrate uh, the cuisine of the low country and highlight um, the uniqueness of uh, Southeastern cuisine. Next slide. Um, one of the things that Queen Quet had brought up to us is the importance also of, uh, of developing a bed that would serve as a kitchen garden, things like garlic, mint, and herbs. Uh, and, uh, and again, you know, when we, when we walked with, through the garden with Queen Quet, uh, she had us record her, and, and, and I have in a couple of these slides some of the longer quotes from, from our exchange here, but uh, she talked very specifically about um, her community's use uh, of mint and, and where they might plant it and find it. Uh, and so I, I would imagine we can demonstrate these kinds of um, life ways uh, within the garden space. Next slide. And um, again, this is not any sort of final plan, but just a sense of the scope of what we could achieve at this site. Uh, a number of different garden beds, a site to teach uh, students, um, you know, and, and as well as some um, stanchions, some of which would have audio recordings as well. Uh, and so, uh, as well as some, some of our uh, continued use of raised bed, uh, I'm sorry, row crops, that's what you see in the, the green over there. Uh, and there, we have to note, though, that the site does have a, a, an area that tends to flood, but it is also a great site to grow watermelon, uh, as an example. And one other thing I'll note uh, about our site plan, 
uh, is that you cross a little uh, gully and bridge in order to cross over into the site. And you see that on the schematic on the on the bottom left hand side, a little bridge that that goes over where you can start your your view. Uh, next slide. And right now this is actually what's literally there, just three raised bed beds that we partnered with the Green Heart Project uh, to construct here. Um, but again, I'll just go over uh, just a few other additional ideas uh, that we've gotten from Queen Quet on how to build out uh, the themes and the purposes of uh, some of the messaging we might have at this site. Uh, next slide. So, for example, uh, as you walk across that initial bridge, uh, Queen Quet had the thought of, at least for a portion of the way, have the have the paths be made of oyster shells, uh, because uh, and to have a stanchion and an image of uh, that that tie uh, that the first inhabitants had, not not only on the on the soil, but but on the waters too. Uh, and, and also emphasizing the community practice of replanting and reuse and recycling of materials. Uh, again, um, uh, then Queen said, "Well, uh, uh, this this you can you can construct this to, as a as a good introduction uh, to the site as you walk into it." Um, next slide here. One of the other ideas that she shared with us uh, is, is the possibility of, especially near the row crops probably, is to, is to record uh, her and, and some of her uh, community members singing some of the work songs. She, she said it was important um, to have an audio presence on the site uh, and, and there are you know, possibilities to make um, those kinds of um, structures where you could either press a button or, or as Queen indicated, you could uh, cross a particular threshold and it triggers um, the audio to play. And, and we could do it not just with songs, but also certain oral histories uh, that we may want to, to play at any given uh, part of the garden bed. Next slide. And, and then uh, one other idea I wanted to share with you that she uh, had for us is to emphasize uh, the importance of the garden or an, an agriculture as an adaptation strategy for these early uh, communities. Um, one of the things that uh, Queen Quet noted um, was that she would prefer to see uh, some part of the garden bring together both the Native American crops and traditions, such as the, the Three Sisters uh, ideas uh, about um, soil, um, low, using low, uh, low inputs uh, for agriculture is called the Three Sisters method in some Native American agricultural techniques. But then um, Queen, would, Queen wanted to also see it bridged with some other techniques um, derived from, from Gullah Geechee laborers, um, in part because she says it's very difficult necessarily to absolutely divide out these particular groups of enslaved peoples. There was a lot of intermarriage and a lot of shared traditions. And uh, again, I showed you the there were dry, we had dry, we were drying some of the gourds that you're seeing growing in this image. And uh, Gourds were, of course, used by Native American groups for bowls, for instruments, and all sorts of things, but also by um, West Africans uh, as well. And so Queen uh, Quet thought that it would be a really great idea to have some audio playing of the languages being spoken uh, by, by multiple cultural groups uh, and and maybe talk about gourds or or talk about uh, that inner marriage that had gone on uh, in in some of that um, early history there. So next um, slide. So again, that's sort of a summary of where we're at in this project. We are still at a pretty clean slate phase of things, just starting to coalesce around particular ideas about what's going to go in this garden and, and what kinds of materials 
we can, can both physically construct at the site as well as curriculum types uh, of materials. Uh, Queen Quet uh, and, and a few of the others that, I've, uh, uh, that I hadn't mentioned are, are signed on as, as partners in, in continuing this design. Uh, but of course, we want to more fully engage formal partnerships uh, and, and make sure that we engage in a really interdisciplinary cross-campus cross collaboration I see roles, for example, not only from, from the historians on our campus, uh, but also the art majors on our campus that might uh, might draw out uh, some heirloom species or, or whatever, or, or, or create a sculpture in the garden space as well uh, as a site to also help us uh, think through and commemorate uh, these laborers. And so, um, I think that's uh, that's pretty much what I have. Uh, you can you forward to the last slide, uh, which has my contact information uh, going on. Um, uh, but as I said, I, I'd be more than happy to share this slide so you can get to read some of those uh, quotes in, in more detail. And for sure, uh, as soon as we're out of the pandemic phase, I really would love to meet with some more people and, and start to really draft out a final plan uh, that we can do uh, in this garden space. Thank you. Unmute yourself, Unmute yourself, please. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Owens. I want to go ahead and just quickly wrap this up. Sorry about that. I was on mute. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of the actions that are taking place because of the research, because of the work and effort of so many, including scholars, students, faculty, and staff. Um, and it all kind of cum cumulate, cumulate into something much larger, which I'll get into in just a few moments. Uh, but the the whole story behind if these walls can talk is completely organic it was birthed or literally started in the discussion that i had for uh diversity training and it blossomed into a 45 minute film that that we have today it has gotten a great deal of attention um but what i like to try to often do when i get a chance to talk about the documentary is not to necessarily focus on the message of the documentary, which is important, but more so the important fact that we now know the names of some of these individuals as, in the, as important as it is to refer to these individuals who contributed and who have often been overlooked. Um, the names give them an identity. It gives them a face. It gives them a, 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 a definitive purpose. So, you know, we got the names of four individuals who we know contributed to the building of Randolph Hall. Those names are Peggy, Tom, Mudry, and uh, Cuffey. Uh, we don't necessarily assign a gender, but we do know those four were there and they are a great part of the reason why we wanted to move forward with not only telling this important story, but also moving it into a space where we can always remember their legacy. Next slide. So what I basically have been honored to do is to grow a concept into something much bigger. And in the photo where you have right there, I'm literally standing at a wall that having been on the campus for about 13 years, I never took a second glance at, never really thought it was any, any of any importance because it was a building that housed faculty offices. Um, but after doing this work and starting to help the documentary become unfolded, I found that it is very important to let people know that the documentary is talking about a living lab, our very own campus. And the wall where I'm standing in front of is not too far from Rivers Green. And as a um, interesting point of view is that I was able to find um, some of those imprinted marks, those finger marks of those individuals, most likely children who built those bricks. They are forever there. And so the documentary is a voice for those voices that were never given a chance to be heard. One of the focuses of the documentary is West African ingenuity. 
to help people and our audiences to understand that when we're talking about enslaved individuals, when we're talking about their contribution, we are also, as, um, as has been mentioned before, we are also talking about the intellectual as well as the skill that they brought to, the con to, to our continent and how that actually plays out to our architectural beauty, some of the culture, some of the traditions, some of, even down to some of the things that we eat. And so we wanna make sure we honor that and make sure that their legacy continues. Uh, so with the documentary right now, I can gladly say after almost a year, we are literally in the editing phase. So we sh we're hoping to have this done um, sometime this summer and be able to premiere it in June. So I say that with great confidence. Um, as we wrap it up, I know I'm kind of running, I got five more minutes. Uh, I would like to go ahead and move to the next slide because here's the cool thing. The documentary became a part of something much bigger and I allowed it to do that because I'm a big, big believer in things happen for a reason. And so we built this wonderful big idea for the 250th anniversary for the College of Charleston. The idea takes into takes multiple facets of ideas that are across the campus. So we have our documentary, If These Walls Can Talk. We had the 1967 Legacy Program, uh, I mean club and some other entities that were um, developed by the Center for the Study of Slavery, English professors, the historical um, committee for the 250th anniversary and put together this beautiful program, which is going to put in action, not only our history, not only the work that all of, all of us are doing, but it's going to continue through the students. It's going to include scholarships where those students are not only going to receive great fun uh, support, financial support, they will also receive opportunities, enrichment that, that would teach them about uh, African heritage from West Africa and more. We will also include opportunities where these students will learn how to lead in diverse environments, not just here in, within the, the walls of the United States, but also globally. What are those global leadership skills? And then to make sure that they have the success beyond college. And so that entire program came from a true collaboration to make sure the descendants of our African and African-American laborers are forever a part of this campus. The 1967 Legacy Program has gotten a great deal of attention. It is definitely one of the top priorities for our president and the senior team, as we have had a number of people interested financially to support our program, but also just to volunteer to help make sure it comes together. Um, the, the, the bottom line is, is that when we talk about our history as a college, the documentary, the 1967 Legacy Program, all the research that has been done, it is now coming to a place where we can no longer and will no longer allow it to be ignored. It is now at a place where everyone can not only read about it, but reflect on it, to digest it, to process it, and to actually move our entire campus into a completely different and dare I say transformative space so that our campus knows their true pluralistic history in order to move forward into a much more global transformative space. So on that note, I will say thank you so much for your time. I appreciate uh, being on a panel with all these other wonderful scholars. I appreciate all the work that everybody's doing, both the students, faculty, and staff members. And I continue to look forward to the great things our college do uh, in honor of African and African-American students and their ancestors. Hello everyone, thank you so much for attending our brown bag today. I wanna to thank the panelists for their contributions. One of the aims of this um, program was to bring, they're all called hidden projects. And so when I found there were so many hidden projects, I thought it would be great to bring them out into light. And so I uh, really appreciate all of you for your insights. I also wanna thank my committee members, Dr. Nathaniel Walker, Dr. Barry Seifel, 
uh, Kristen Havinson and Rachel Donaldson for their support. And we're all under the leadership of the wonderful stewardship of Dr. Bernie Powers, who serves as the director of the center. Um, and we have time for questions. If we have a pending one question that you want to uh, for our panelists, uh, please put it in the chat. Um, otherwise, we will close out of today. Uh, while we're waiting for someone to put a chat, um, Trent, um, do you have any update for funding for the bottle tree? The the an update for funding of it is that it will be raised entirely with fundraising and I do not have a current way that people can donate to it just yet. We need to set up a College of Charleston Foundation account and then after that get like the you know the the mechanism to do it. After that's made then I would you know obviously love to share it with everyone so Soon we we'll, we will have that down. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you, Trent. And then for Annette, how would someone come to visit after all of this is over? <laughs> the uncertainty. Um. Yeah. Uh, so we do have volunteer days at the site in general. Um as well as uh you know you can schedule a visit especially if if anyone wants to really be involved in the planning team i would imagine we would schedule a couple of, of site visits as well um there are um it's not the stono preserve is not open to the public per se right now you have to be able to schedule a particular time in which uh some of our staff is already there and and we have uh GAs and uh, graduate assistants and sometimes uh, undergraduate interns that do go out to the site and also in in events that we plan there uh, we can also uh, arrange to have a shuttle come from campus for for students that really want to um, be a collective and, and come over uh, to the site. It is about between 20 and 30 minutes uh, from the downtown campus, so it's not the most uh, convenient for those that that only walk. Um, but but absolutely, there are a number of ways where we either do carpooling or uh, or a van trip for those that want to get out there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Watson. Um, we have a question about um, black faculty um, and the treatment of black faculty that's being at the campus. Um, I know there were a couple of events um, back in February where the uh, college had a, throughout the history of the 250th are kind of talking about that history of treatment of black students and faculty at the college. And so there's definitely a understanding of that history and uh, working to uh, make that more public and also to how to improve the status of black faculty and other represented faculty um, working in college today. And so um, Dr. Owens has something she wants to say. Yeah, um, in addition to what uh, what you said, Aisha, um, with the 1967 legacy program, the really cool thing about that, I didn't get a chance to mention, but when we talked about the African heritage and, um, and uh, some of the other enrichment pieces, it is really calling uh, attention, great deal of attention to the African American Studies program, where there is a great deal of faculty who are of African descent who teach in that program as well. We are also reaching out to other institutions um, to see how we can build mentoring for African, uh, uh, African faculty to connect with our students here. So we want to make sure, again, both sides of the teaching and learning process is well taken care of, especially when it comes to African and African Americans on our, on our campus. And we hope that comes together in some form through the Le 1967 Legacy Program, if not in other opportunities that's happening or even being thought about around our campus at this time. Great, thank you. 
Um, also at Avery, we have collections of black faculty, Dr. Eugene Hunt and um, that and staff like Dr. Um, Lucille Whipper. And so you can come and view those collections at Avery once they reopen um, to understand their experiences at the colleges too. Um, with that, we will conclude our session today. Uh, thank you so much. It's being recorded, so we will publicly be accessible um, later on and look forward to more activities from the Avery Digital Classroom in the coming months.